There we go. Okay, so at least now we are recording. And I've got to share the screen. And we share the desktop. And now we ask. Oh, there and there. Okay, so can you see that thing with the cliff and the valley? Yes. Oh, yep. good. Aristotle wrote this, character is revealed through action. He did that in a book called The Poetics, which is about drama. I strongly urge you to read the book at some point, you know, after you're... <laughs> You don't really start learning until after you get out of school because you don't have any time while you're in school. So uh, most of what I've learned, I've learned since school when I've had the time to actually read books that are interesting. So Aristotle wrote this book about drama called The Poetics and perhaps the most important thing he said in there was character is revealed through action. You don't just say this person is mean or that person is nice, you, you show them. Let's see if I can uh, do, there you go. You show them doing things. So a mean person is mean because they do mean and nasty things. And a nice person is nice because he does nice things. That's the way we do it. And that's what you have to do in interactive storytelling. The central task you have is to have your characters interact with the player. They have to do things, which means you have to write the code that will make the decisions for the characters. And those decisions must reflect their, their characters, their personalities. That's your big job, and that's what you know, that's what you want focus almost all your time on. So, how do you do that? Well, um, oh wait, before I say that, I want to emphasize something extremely important, and that is that far too many people, especially technical people, waste their time on what a character looks like rather than what who a character is. I'd like to take you back about 20 years ago to these two movies, which came out at about the same time. Um, Final Fantasy was actually based on a video game and Shrek wasn't. Uh, the thing about Final Fantasy was the game designer who, who ended up doing this movie was really, like all games people, was really worried about whether the characters looked real. So they went to enormous lengths. This was 20 years ago, writing computer code that would very, very <clears throat> accurately show what the characters look like. And so they came up with extremely realistic looking characters. For example, here's the protagonist of that movie. That's really good looking computer uh, 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 imagery, especially considering that it was done more than 20 years ago. Very impressive technologically. <laughs> That's not very good. I mean, <laughs> he doesn't have any hair or many hairs. He only has eyebrows. And, you know, this just isn't very accurate, is it? But, Oh, here's another one from uh, Final Fantasy. Again, a very realistic looking face. The problem was that their faces, while photographically accurate, were emotionally dull. Whereas the characters in Shrek had all sorts of emotional expressions on their faces. They did interesting things. Whereas the characters in Final Fantasy looked boring. So that was a huge difference. And the result was that, oh wait, what's this one here? There we go. Final Fantasy had total of $137 million in revenue. Shrek, wait a minute, I've got that wrong. 
Uh, let me look it all up. Hmm. I'm not sure what those numbers represent. I know the green is Shrek. The budget. Oh, that's right. Thank you. You're much smarter than I am. Final Fantasy cost 137 million, whereas Shrek cost 85 million. And so, um, uh, and yet Final Fantasy earned only $50 million in revenue, which means that it, uh, Final Fantasy lost $87 million, whereas Shrek had revenues of $492 million. To put it another way, going after good looking faces is a waste of time and money. What's important is having characters who do interesting things. Are there some other? There we go. Oh, and Shrek had all sorts of sequels. So that franchise earned a total of three and a half billion dollars. Oh, there were also three TV shred, uh, specials, two short films, one theme park attraction, 12 video games and countless toys. Shrek was, a, was immensely profitable because it was done by artists, not programmers. The people who made Shrek were concerned with making a good story with good characters, not good images. This is a very important lesson. So, so let's uh, turn to the question of how you actually make an interesting character. For example, let's suppose we're worried about whether a character is uh, a coward. Is he cowardly or courageous? <clears throat> now, if we wanna do it the wrong way, we would simply have somebody say, that man is cowardly, but that's not doing it, that's talking about it. And that's the wrong way to do it. Let's put it in context. Let's imagine one of, you know, one of those Hollywood Western movies with cowboys. And let's imagine that we've got, uh, wait a minute, gee, this, what is this thing doing here? I need to get that, oh well. Uh, let's imagine that the, that the two main characters here are the kid and Black Bart. And you can see who the good guy is and who the bad guy is. Can you see the text along the bottom uh, that says the ballad of uh, Buster Strike? Uh, that's a, on Netflix. That is a great movie. Have any of you seen it? Yes, I've seen it. Uh, yeah, it's beautiful. Uh, it is very, very good. It's excellent storytelling. And uh, it, it, that particular one is rather short. It's actually, the movie as a whole is like five different short films, uh, two of which are really dull, but uh, <laughs> three of which are actually very good. The best thing about one of them is the character is standing, is about to be hanged. And he's standing up on the platform next to a couple of other guys. And he turns to one of them and says, is this your first time? Uh, which, <laughs> whatever. <laughs> anyway, so let's just imagine, I'm changing the names, by the way. Um, the, uh, the names in the story are different, but, um, Let's imagine the kid and Black Bart. The kid walks into the saloon and Black Bart says something really nasty like, we don't serve your kind around here. And what is the kid gonna do about this? You know, this is an opportunity to show whether he's cowardly or courageous. So let's, let's go back and look. Here's an equation we could use, very simple here. If a cowardly courageous, by the way, I'm assuming that we're using the standard system running between minus one and plus one with zero being neutral. So if he's very courageous, it's like 0.8. And if he's a slightly cowardly, then it's minus 0.2. And we simply ask if cowardly courageous is greater than zero, then he's brave and he'll defy Black Bart. But if it's less than zero, he'll run away. That was easy, trivial. And that's about the way it's often done. 
but it's the wrong way, or at least it's not very good because it makes, it's a very simplistic character and it doesn't take into account other considerations. So let's add another consideration. Let's take into account how serious the threat is. I mean, if Black Bart were, you know, this little wimp and he doesn't even have a gun, he just you know, holds up a bottle and says, you get out of here or I'll hit you on the head with a bottle if I could reach up that high. Um, well, that's not very dangerous. And so the kid probably doesn't, isn't gonna be afraid. And so he doesn't need to be that worried. He doesn't need to be that courageous. So instead we use this little formula if his cowardly courageous is greater than the safe dangerous number, then he'll defy him. Otherwise he'll run away. Okay, that's a little better. That is more dramatically appropriate because it takes into account how uh, the, the factor of danger. But now let's add another consideration. Let's suppose that the kid has a girlfriend named Sweet Nell, and she, this is a cowboy Western, right? And she is uh, in the same saloon and she's watching the kid. Oh, if she's there, he doesn't want to run away, does he? Well, it depends. I mean, how scary is Black Bart? How courageous is the kid? And how much does he need her to admire his courage. I mean, maybe they're so much in love that she won't care. Uh, maybe they're just, she's just getting to know him and this is an important point and he wants to impress her. So we need to take that into account. And so we add a third variable, how confident or needy he is. Those may not be the right words, but the basic idea is how much does he need her approval? How much does he need to impress her? So, oh, geez, it's not obvious how to write the formula for that. And yet this is a much more interesting problem. This is dramatically significant because now he has to trade off two factors, how dangerous the situation is and how much he wants to impress Sweet Nell. That's interesting. But how do we write the equation for that? Well, I will get into that. That's a job for next week because it involves the blend operator, which I couldn't tell you about this week. But uh, actually, I'm going to give you a video to watch. I'll, I'll send it by email um, that does talk about it. Um, but let me give you another example of how complicated this can get. What if we give him three options? Now that he could quietly defy Black Bart, that is say, hey, you do what you need to do and I'll do what I need to do. Or he could aggressively defy Black Bart, say, oh yeah, says who? So those are very different reactions or he can run away. Okay, now he has three choices. You can't use an if then statement. Now you got to do something different. How are you going to do that? Again, I will show you about that stuff next week. But uh, before I can show you how to do that, I have to teach you about this blend operator. Um, and let's see, I believe that is all I have in this. Yes, it is. So I'm going to stop the sharing. Uh, so uh, my point here, the, the crucial observation is that uh, interactive storytelling, turn, the crucial issues you have as a designer involve your characters making decisions about what they're going to do. And those decisions have to be dramatically interesting decisions. Have you ever noticed that in, in video games, you never really make 
difficult decisions. You're just, well, maybe, ooh, should I run to the right or should I run to the left? But you never make dramatically interesting decisions. You never end up saying, gee, if I do this, it'll hurt my friend's feelings. But if I do that, uh, I might get punched in the face. Those are dramatically interesting questions and they're never addressed in video games. That's what interactive storytelling is for. So the, the whole focus of your efforts is on the decisions that the characters make. And those decisions are gonna be made based on calculations in algorithms. And this is where all the math comes in. This is why the math is important. And as you can see, that math can get very messy, very quickly. And uh, promises, promises. And next week I'll show you uh, the right way to do that. Uh, now, last week when I talked about number systems, I, I talked about bounded numbers, did I not? Num well, there are actually two ways to do bounded numbers. Um, let me let me briefly explain. The fundamental idea for bounded numbers is that you want them to stay between minus one and plus one. So uh, no matter what, because you don't want to have to deal with numbers that go way out into nowhere. Um, you want to, uh, oh yes, of course. I think it was a problem of, uh, of vocabulary now because you talked, but I think we were confused by the word bounded. Oh, oh, I'm sorry. So I did, okay, I did talk about, yeah, yes, I'm using, a, I'm sorry, I was trained in physics and I'm using a mathematical term, bounded. You guys have to jump on me when I do this because it uh, it's hard for me to break loose from, you'll have the same problem. You're being brought up certain way of thinking and, uh, you'll end up using the wrong words for different people. So, uh, but let me show you a different issue if I can find, I thought I put it here. Well, I'll just have to describe it uh, verbally. Uh, imagine, uh, imagine you're writing a, a story world about uh, romance, boy meets girl and so forth. And uh, it's early in the, in the romance and the boy wants to win the girl's heart. So he brings her flowers and she appreciates that. And because he brings her flowers, she likes him just a little bit more, okay? Not a lot, but a little bit. Well, if you're a programmer, then you just say, all right, let's write a four next loop where he does it a thousand times. He gives her flowers again and again and again and again and again. And each time she likes him a little more, a little more, a little more, a little more, a little more. If he gives her uh, enough flowers, she'll get in bed with him, right? Mathematics. Uh, no, it doesn't work that way. And how do you deal with that? Well, as a storyteller, mathematically, the correct way to do it involves messy math. Uh, that just makes your math blah, horrible. But there's a much simpler way, and that uh, actually there are two ways. One is to use this weird system for bounded numbers that I developed many years ago, where you can add numbers, but each time you're adding tinier and tinier ones. And so it never quite reaches one. It's like Zeno's paradox. Do you ever did did anybody ever tell you about Zeno's paradox? Yeah, the programmer, right? <laughs> okay. Um, here's Zeno's paradox. Uh, let's say that um, uh, you're in a race, and the uh, uh, it, you know. A hare and a tortoise are in a race, and we look at the hare and we say the hare is running faster and faster than the tortoise. But wait, what if we say we we say the hare goes this far in the first five seconds, 
But then we're going to say in the next two and a half seconds, he only goes this far. And then in the next one and a quarter, he only goes that far. And so on and so on and so on and so on. Eventually, he won't be moving at all. He'll be going such tiny steps that there won't be any motion. He'll never get there, will he? Well, actually, it's rather silly paradox. If you know any math, you can easily say, ah, that's stupid. But the idea of this weird bounded number system I had sort of builds that concept into the numbers themselves. And so you can keep adding numbers, but you'll never get to plus one, never. However, I discovered that you can use the blend operator to uh, solve the same problem. That is, you don't need to use a weird number system. Uh, but you don't use addition or subtraction or multiplication or division. You use this blend thing. Uh, so that's, uh, that's one of the problems you will face in interactive storytelling, that uh, your algorithms is a basic problem in all programming. You come up with an algorithm and you think it's going to work and then it doesn't work. Remember the Sorcerer's Apprentice? That's an algorithm that the programmer didn't quite understand and it ran away from him on an infinite loop. Ah! Same thing. So uh, uh, that will happen to you. You're going to end up being the Sorcerer's Apprentice many times, uh, writing algorithms that produce, here we go, I'll give you a really good example. Uh, gosh, this is about 25 years ago when I was first starting off and I was working on a, uh, an Arthurian legends game and, uh, or story world. And one of the things that I thought was very important was gossip. That is people tell each other about things that are happening. This is fundamental to all drama. You have an enormous amount of drama where somebody tells somebody else something they shouldn't know maybe uh whoop here we go so um so it is vitally important or i believe that it was vitally important that uh uh we have a system whereby people characters can tell each other about the events that they have witnessed so okay um Let's, let's consider that. Uh, I came up with this great system. I said, why would one character tell another character about something? Well, here are the factors that would apply. One, how much does this character like that character? If he really likes him, he's probably going to tell him. Second, uh, the thing he wants to tell him is about a third party. So I'm, I'm going to tell you about what this person did. So, but the chances that I'll tell you increase the more I like this person. In other words, if I'm going to tell you, hey, did you hear that Joe uh, Frembley died? Well, if I don't care about Joe Frembley, I'm not going to bother telling you. So the more I care about that person, the more likely I am to talk about that. Okay, let's see. Oh, another consideration. How much does this person care about the third person? In other words, if you're Joe Friendly's best friend and I found out that Joe Friendly died, then I'm going to want to tell you that Joe Friendly died. So those are some of the factors. And so I thought about them all and I came up with an algorithm that took all of those factors into account. And I was set, boy, this, this'll really do well. And so I set to work running rehearsals. Rehearsal is interactive storytelling for playtest in games. And, uh, and so I ran the rehearsals and on the first rehearsal, lo and behold, Lancelot, bedded Guinevere. They, they had sex. Okay. This is like, this is what's supposed to happen, right? Um, and then the very next morning, Lancelot runs into King Arthur. And Lancelot says to himself, I really like King Arthur. 
I really like Guinevere. I know that Arthur likes Guinevere. Therefore, hey, Arthur, guess what? I just had sex with your wife. Oops. This is the kind of thing that happens to you all the time. And you just have to think these things through. And normally you learn them the hard way. So uh, that's why you have to have rehearsals, not only in real plays and movies, but in interactive story worlds, you need rehearsals. So let's see. Uh, I'm gonna stop here and just let's have some open discussion. I've said an awful lot. Comments, questions arguments. Uh, I got uh, uh, no, no question, but I wanted to share uh, um, a video game I played during uh, <clears throat> these days. Uh, can you hear me well? Uh, fairly well. I have bad ears. I, have I can hear faint sounds but I have difficulty understanding uh, language. For some reason, the words, I miss the words. Um, okay, <clears throat> I will try to be... Uh, speak uh, to be... slowly like okay. I'm a little child. Okay, okay. <laughs> so, uh, uh, first thing, uh, I had a question, but uh, it's more about uh, uh, the previous lesson because uh, I wasn't present. Uh, so if there's a, a record of that lesson, uh, it would be nice uh, to record yes, it. Yes, there me. is a recording. So let me just make a note. I will send an email to you guys later today with uh, the recording of last week's session. And I also, video to watch. Okay, yeah, they, they, I did record it. And actually, I, I think I recorded the whole thing, whereas this one, I was kind of late in, in remembering to record it, so. Okay, thank you. Oh, okay. And uh, another thing I wanted to, uh, it's not a question, it's more an argument. Uh, wanted to share an experience with a video game I had because uh, uh, this come up to my mind when you talk about uh, decisions making and uh, how in uh, video games you don't truly have a uh, strong decision and this is why exists uh, uh, interact interactive storytelling. And I think that uh, a perfect example of it uh, is uh, the Stanley Parable. I don't know if uh, uh, you ever s heard about it. No. It's uh, very particular. It's, uh, um, it's not a true video game, but it tells himself, itself uh, as a video game because it's a trap. It's not a true video game. Uh, you are uh, uh, not an office man, uh, you are a worker as uh, uh, many other workers around the world called Stanley. And uh, in this game, the gamer is uh, Stanley and the other character you can uh, interact uh, in a certain way is the narrator of the story. Okay, so there you start with this narrator that tells you what is happening and what is going to happen. But you can eventually change the story. When, for example, the narrator will say, Stanley decides to take the first door on the right, you can decide to take the door on the left. And from this point, moving on, the narrator will start to talk directly to the player and uh, breaking the fourth wall. And uh, the entire game is based on the fact that uh, in video games, if you follow the, uh, the instructions that are given to you, you will win. In fact, in the game, in Stanley Parable, if you follow the exact uh, instructions of the narrator, 
you unlock uh, the only good ending that in the video game is present. Mm -hmm. While if you decide to go by on your own to don't follow the path of the narrator, the ending will be always bad. You die, you completely lose control of your mind, the narrator abandons you. You got only bad endings if you follow your instinct. And basically, the game exists to address uh, this problem. The fact that uh, in video games, uh, you are not uh, making decision. You are just following a path. And by following that path uh, that is uh, uh, scripted, you, um, you just want to uh, feel comfort uh, to have uh, a story that has been already written. Because the game basically does can't reach uh, this freedom level that uh, uh, players want to have in video games, but that it's impossible to reach. And that's it. I wanted to share this because uh, uh, I thought it's uh, very interesting and uh, I think it's the only video game slash interactive storytelling uh, that uh, addresses directly this problem of decision and uh, how truly free people are in uh, not only video games, but uh, also in other uh, interactive media. That raises a very important point for all interactive storytelling. And that is the player has to be able to win his or her own way. That is, if you do something where and there are lots of these, typically adventure games, text adventures, interactive fiction, that kind of stuff. They're, they're not games, they're puzzles. And a puzzle has only one solution. Games have many, many solutions. And so you want your player to be able to win in many ways. In fact, among game designers, I don't know, back in the day when, when we game designers talked a lot about theory. Uh, everybody agreed on a fundamental point, uh, and that was that every player has to be able to win in a in their own particular way, reflective of their own personality. So there had to be a million ways to win a game. Uh, but we all agreed that's impossible. So let's just try to make as many ways as possible. Um, so that's, that's something to keep in mind in your interactive storytelling. Now, it is complicated by the fact that in storytelling, you're trying to make a point. You're trying to teach the player something. You're trying to communicate something about the human condition. And there, for example, let's say, Here's a simple one. You want to show that uh, a married person having an affair is a bad idea. They're gonna, it's gonna hurt. Um, well, in that case, uh, you know, you're gonna have your player have an affair and then suffer the consequences. You can't have an arrangement where the player has a, an affair and then ta-da wins and gets filthy rich and is famous and so forth. No, you can't permit that. That's not your message. So you have to think about how to make your message in a million different ways. Uh, perhaps one way, by the way, I strongly urge you to uh, do some teaching. There's nothing that uh, humiliates you more than trying to teach something you think you know you understand. Um, <laughs> uh, my first year teaching, I was teach teaching physics at the college level. I will never forget, I was up there explaining a really complicated thing about the nature of electromagnetic radiation. I was drawing these vectors and, you know, they're at right angles to this and going up and down from that and so forth. And, I, and drawing equations, showing what it all means. And then suddenly I stop and I realize this is wrong. This, the way I'm describing it can't work. And uh, I stared at it for about a minute and then I just turned and said, class dismissed. And then I went home and studied all my textbooks and 
figured out what I'd gotten wrong and the next day I fixed it. You will learn more about anything by trying to teach it than by studying it. Um, and you will learn that everybody thinks differently. And so the way you teach one person won't work with another, which is why lectures are so stupid. You know, there, there are you know, only six of you here, but at least you have the opportunity to stop me and say, wait, wait, I don't understand that. Now, you don't do it very often. I'm sure there are moments when you're saying, huh, what do you mean? But you're, you're too quiet because you're European students, not American students. American students would be saying, wait a minute there, that's wrong. I'd be fighting with them all the way through. You got <laughs> different cultures. Anyway, um, so you need to learn this lesson that to communicate, you had to come in from many different angles because that's what you have to do in interactive storytelling too. You have to communicate the idea from different angles. Very difficult. Uh, I just realized, though, while I was talking, that I screwed up. One of the, the very first thing I should have done was to have asked each of you to tell me what you want to get out of this. So I, I'm going to start with you, Sorabi. And how is it pronounced? It's Sorabi. Sorabi. Okay. Yes. I'll get it wrong. Uh, what's your background? Uh, you know, what have you been studying? What do you want to do? And 10 years from now, what will you be doing if, if things go according to plan? So could you tell me that? Okay. Oh, so, what you want to get out of this? Okay. So I am from architecture background. Uh, so I completed my architecture in 2015 and uh, then uh, I have been working with companies and uh, then uh, while working with them I was mostly into firstly I was uh, on site working with the maps and the constructions and everything and then after that uh, I was uh, into an interior firm where I was mainly involved in presentations and uh, branding and all stuff. And uh, then there I explored that I have more interest in uh, some visual parts, graphic parts, rather than uh, working uh, with the architecture thing. So I worked there for two years and uh, my interest developed more into the des designing part. And uh, then I chose to uh, change my field and come here. And, uh, and especially if I'm taking this lecture, I wanted to explore more how to express things. You said like it can be done with numbers. I was really curious how, how to express things with numbers. And uh, other than any idea, like I'm not very good at expressing ideas or expressing any story or interaction. So I really want to know from the point it initiates, how do you initiate? Even if uh, an idea comes to your mind, how that idea comes to your mind? So that is the basic thing I want to learn out of this. And uh, in 10 years, I would definitely say, uh, if I get to learn how to express ideas, I will do anything if I have the expression in my hand, like whatever I explore more and I can express it to people, people can understand that, that would be the best thing for me. Okay. Okay, very good. Uh, uh, Yasmina, would you tell me about yourself? Yeah, of course. Uh, my background is both in uh, graphic design and cinema of animation. And um, I'm actually not very um, knowledgeable about uh, the world of interactive uh, storytelling and et cetera, because mostly the media that I use, it's pretty much from point A to point B. So you have like, you make a film and you present it, or you make, for example, a comic and you like 
publish it, for example. So I did not really have, uh, uh, this is all very new to me. This is maybe a reason why I'm pretty silent because this is all very new. So I actually was in introduced to this kind of thing with this class. And um, I do have some experience in my coding, but it's like just like writing code, but it's really basic. So it's mostly, for example, um, if I need to do a basic website or stuff like that. So when uh, you have announced uh, 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 this class, I was very interested to know um, how can I actually push uh, this kind of uh, language and how can I actually get more involved into interactive storytelling and uh, obviously using uh, the language of computers and etc. So I suppose that, that is a really good like introduction for this kind of thing. Okay. And what do you, what do you hope to be doing in 10 years? Mm, I really hope I can be to do either like even a job or something that would actually involve being uh, creative and being actually to put myself out there. Um, I have really a lot of ideas to really put into this world, but sometimes I wonder which are the best way to do it. So I hope like in 10 years, I'll be able to do exactly that. Okay. okay. Mm -hmm. Mateo. Hi. Um... I'm Matteo, I studied uh, uh, communication design at uh, Poimi. Uh, and uh, I uh, decided to study, uh, to take the, uh, to study, to take uh, the bachelor degree and now the master's degree because uh, I always been uh, interested in interactive uh, media and uh, with this master, I had the possibility to study interactive storytelling. And uh, in fact, uh, I'm very interested. I mean, I've always been interested in uh, interactive storytelling. Since uh, I'm a gamer, I play lots of video games. And uh, also, I hope to work uh, in this field of, uh, of game design. Uh, but uh, rather than the uh, engineering part, uh, I prefer to work uh, on the graphical and uh, artistic part. In fact, uh, I've always been passionate about uh, uh, the concept art, uh, the elaboration of the concept, uh, the realization of the characters. And uh, to resume everything, I'm very interested uh, especially in character design, in giving at the characters uh, an aesthetical importance and also an importance for their, um, uh, for their behavior uh, and personality. And uh, I decided to follow these lessons because uh, I was curious, the, 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 the main thing because uh, since uh, I've always liked video games and uh, since I've always al always played them, I wanted to uh, see the um, opinion of someone that can uh, work uh, on the technical part since it's a part that for me it's very hard to uh, understand because I've never studied engineering. I've always worked uh, in the field of graphic design, uh, illustration, and stuff like that. I can uh, also write stories. Uh, I've tried it many times, so I can say that uh, I can understand many things about uh, how to develop uh, an interactive story, but just under a writing point of view rather than coding. Coding is my big leg. So I want to follow this lesson just to understand the possible base, uh, basic of this field. Okay. Okay. Good, good. Um, Paulina? Uh, hi. So I finished also architecture in my bachelor uh, some years ago. I've tried studying building engineering and then COVID started and it messed up everything. So I've decided to go more into digital world and the, what I'm doing is digital and interaction design right now. 
So it, it's architecture, but in, in a digital sphere. And right now I'm about to finish my studies at Politecnico. And currently I'm doing my master thesis in game design. So this is the reason why I wanted to attend also your course. Like, uh, I don't know if you know John Sharp. He, I know that he knows you, but I'm not oh. sure if you know him. Doug Sharp or John? Sharp? John, John, John Sharp. No, I don't know him. I know Doug, Doug Sharp, but <laughs> Doug is no, old uh, like I am. So. From Parsons, he's from Parsons. Uh, so I'm doing my thesis with him and he's also a game designer. Okay, so what do you hope to be doing in 10 years? Um, if things are really good, maybe to have my own uh, studio that will deal with digi different digital products. Okay. Okay, uh, Shman? So uh, my name is Sharon and Sharon. <laughs> yes, yes. You told me last week. I'll never remember. No, don't worry. <laughs> it's not a problem. So uh, um, my background basically, I have two bachelor bachelors. One that I basically like. I did it. I work a little bit uh, with it, but then I realized it wasn't the right one. And it's cultural linguistic mediation. And then I started to have, like, I started to study for a second bachelor, which is communication design, and I did it in Polytechnical. And now I'm enrolled in the digital interaction design masters uh, here in Polytechnical. And I had the possibility to choose this class among different studios. Um, and I got in because <laughs> this is for mostly for the communication design people. And it looked like the most interesting one uh, compared to the, all the others, which is a little bit different from, from what I do in my master's because we focus a lot of, on UX. So basically a lot of research, data, user analysis, like a lot on it more than like the, the story you're going to tell. <laughs> yeah, yeah. It's more about technical stuff, data, so more... I would say a scientific approach, maybe, I don't know how to call it, like um, less creative things to do because basically you have data and you have to follow what data say. And yes, you can have a creative idea, but it's very, like you have many, um, mm. I forgot how to say it in English, but you're not completely free. <laughs> I don't know how to say it. Hmm. Interesting. I would have, <laughs> the funny thing is, I was trained as a physicist, you know, science, math, empirical data, and so forth. But I think communication is an artistic effort. Yeah, it, communication, it, yes. But I do, I'm studying the digital and interaction design. And basically, like I found out UX is more about data. We studied a little bit of things about neuroscience. Mm -hmm. So, yeah. yeah. <laughs> but this is basically like I think the course I like more this year. So, one question on the communication design how much do they get into linguistics um i mean not much i think but me maybe mm. maybe i'm wrong i don't know because um i don't mm. feel like we were doing about much linguistic uh, perhaps uh, um, more than linguistic yeah perhaps uh, we did something the previous semester um, with uh, the professor Derek de Kerkov, we talk about uh, how language uh, and uh, how our way to learn language, to read books, uh, changed uh, with the introduction of internet. But uh, I think uh, it's not tru truly something linguistic. Uh, communication, it's just uh, observing uh, how language changed during uh, the digital the era of digital media and uh, that's it it's more communicating uh, throughout uh, images and visuals so keep in mind how what can be the 
uh, a good choice of colors to get the attention of people. As uh, Sharon said, uh, said there's neuroscience, so linguistic uh, mm. few, very very few. We just did uh, three semesters, something that it just, uh, um, you know, uh, how language changed with digital media, and that's it. Yeah, I mean, we were asked uh, to when we were uh, doing some projects to think about what to write maybe in brochures or like on posters and so on, but nobody actually taught us anything about it. Hmm. About 30 years ago, I realized that as part of designing software, I needed to understand how humans communicate. And so I started getting into linguistics. I now have, I'm not sure if you can see, you see those bookshelves there? Yeah. That's about, about half of that is linguistics. Uh, because I, I realized the more I learned, the more I realized this is really critical. Uh, interaction, my definition of interactivity is a cyclic process in which the human and the computer alternately listen, think, and speak. So user listens to the computer, in this case, looks at the screen and says, oh, look at that. And then he thinks about it, develops a reaction, and then he expresses, he speaks back to the computer, although he does it with a mouse and a keyboard. Uh, then the computer, uh, the computer listens to what the human says to it, and he thinks about it, and that's the algorithm part, and then he expresses back to the computer, what, uh, to the user, what he's saying. And so it's this cyclic process and this and you got to realize the cyclicity is an important part you don't do it just once you go round and round and round with the computer and there's a lot of convergence that's the way uh conversations work we never just say one thing and we're done with it in a good conversation uh between two people he's this one says something and then that one doesn't quite understand it says but wait a minute what about this and then this one says well here here and then that one goes and you go back and forth and back and forth and you converge on the solution so anyway i'm sorry uh leonardo you want to uh <laughs> tell us about yeah, yourself maybe, uh, very quickly i study communication design uh, at polytechnico both bachelor and master's degree and actually we did something similar to linguistic that is semiotics maybe they will yes. do the, the next year uh, right now i am a game and narrative designers for in italians and american studios and i want to explore the possibility of interactive storytelling so this was my uh, my issue for my master thesis and also I want to, to teach people and to give people a tool to design interactive uh, narratives in general but it's it's very difficult and that's why I'm here with, with you now <laughs> um, because I'm interested in stories in general and the interac interactivity so it's very nice to see how people interact with the, the computers uh, that it's like a digital storyteller for, for people. Uh, in 10 years, I think uh, that I will be um, either dead or just, uh, <laughs> yeah, because I'm very dangerous. <laughs> or I I can, I'm, will continue studying interactive storytelling in general and uh, in games and how games we can become art and uh, how they can teach uh, uh, coherent and uh, important stories uh, and themes and messages to to people. That's uh, that's because I'm a game designer to explore that possibility. Okay, okay, good. Okay, I'm gonna go over all these notes and keep that in mind. And I'm, I apologize for taking up too much of your time and I will see you next week. Bye-bye. Thank, Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you. Bye-bye.